All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and our latest set of RBT exam practice questions where we're going to the next set together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. As always, when you pass, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Jason's wife tells him every morning to put a lid on his coffee cup before he gets into his car. Jason's wife is out of town today, so Jason gets into the car with no lid on his cup and coffee spills everywhere. Now, Jason never gets to, to his car without a lid on his cup. Why? All right, so we're looking at Jason's behavior in particular. We know that Jason's wife tells him to put a lid on the coffee cup before he gets into his car. But remember, we're really looking at Jason and the consequences of his actions. So, Let's look at what happens next. So Jason's wife is out of town. So what does Jason do? He gets into the car with no lid on his cup. As a result, coffee spills everywhere. Now, Jason never gets into his car without a lid on his cup. So we're looking at a consequence question. So a consequence question, really we're looking typically is it reinforcement or punishment? Now, sometimes it'll be extinction, but for the most part, you want to start with either reinforcement or punishment. So the first question you want to ask yourself is, how did the behavior change? Did it increase or did it decrease? Because by looking at how the behavior changes, we can determine is it reinforcing or punishing? Well, we know Jason used to get into the car with his with no lid, and now he never does that. He never gets into his car without a lid on his cup. So his behavior decreased. So we know it's a type of punishment. His punishment decreases, reinforcement increases. So then we have to ask ourselves, is it positive? or negative, meaning the consequence. Was it added positive or was something removed negative? Well, in this case, the coffee spilled everywhere, meaning the spill, the stimuli or stimulus of the spill was added to the environment, making it positive. So we put those two together. We have a positive consequence, meaning was added, that decreased Jason's behavior, meaning punishment. So what happened? Well, positive punishment. As a result of punish, positive punishment, Jason never gets through his car without a lid on his cup. When you're first starting, especially, make sure you break down each question like that. Go through it methodically. The more you do, the better you're going to get. So it might feel slow at first, but that's how it's supposed to feel because you're going to get quicker as you get better at the exam. A yoga instructor tells her class to get into lotus pose and then gets into lotus pose herself. The whole class then attempts to get into lotus pose as the instructor helps them. The class is doing what? So whose behavior are we looking at? We always want to identify that first. We're looking at the class's behavior. So we have this instructor who tells the class, get into lotus pose, and then gets into lotus pose herself. So the yoga instructor, she gives a verbal SD, but then she models. Following the yoga instructor modeling it, the whole class attempts to get into the pose. So since the yoga instructor modeled it for the class and the class followed the model, they responded to the model, what do we call that? What do we call a response following a model? Well, the class is imitating. The instructor is doing the modeling. She's modeling the pose. The class is imitating the pose themselves. The class is not shaping. Shaping is reinforcing approximations of behavior. That's not occurring here. And there's also no chaining. We're looking at the class specifically. The class is not chaining in any way. They're not teaching a task chain. They're not using a task chain in any fashion. The class is simply imitating after the yoga instructor models the pose. Ty rarely completes all of his homework. Ty's parents know that Ty is really looking forward to his friend's birthday party this weekend, so they tell Ty that he can go to the party if he completes all of his homework. What strategy are the parents using? All right, so we're looking at the parents' behavior. Ty rarely completes homework. Ty's parents know that Ty is, wants to go to his friend's birthday party, so what do they do? They use that as an opportunity to use the birthday party or going to the party as reinforcement. They tell Ty, well, you can go to the party if you complete all of your homework. So they've set up this contingency. If you complete your homework, then you can go to the party. Now, what type of contingency specifically 
are they using? A, negative reinforcement. Well, it's not going to be negative because Ty is going to be given the opportunity to go to the party. So if, if anything, it's going to be positive reinforcement. And it's likely not going to be positive punishment because the parents are hoping that if Ty can go to the party, that's going to be reinforcement for his homework. Now, we don't know for sure, but they're certainly not trying to punish the homework behavior because the homework behavior is already low. They're trying to increase that behavior. So what about a high P request sequence? Well, with the high P request sequence, we, we take a bunch of high probability requests. And once those are given and completed, we give a low probability request. Not what we're doing here. It's almost the opposite. Ty has to complete actually the low probability response or request, which is completing the homework. As a result or as a reward, he can engage in the highly preferred response, which is going to the party, which makes that the premac principle. The premac principle or grandma's law says if you engage in a low preferred response, you can then engage in the high preferred response as reinforcement. So the strategy the parents are using looks like the premac principle. Which of the following answer choices is not an example of an automatic consequence? All right, more to the point with this question. We are looking at automatic consequence. So automatic means what? Automatic means alone, not socially mediated. There's not a second person administering the consequence. Your own behavior and your own self is giving you yourself the consequence. It means only one person who is you or the learner. Nobody else is giving the consequence. So let's find a consequence that is automatic. Tyrone is sitting in a busy, oh, excuse me. Let's find a consequence that is not automatic. Remember, let's read carefully. We're looking for a cherry that is not automatic. Tyrone is sitting in a busy waiting room at the dentist's office and starts to get hot, so he takes off his jacket and sets it down next to him. Is anybody else providing Tyrone with the consequence? No, this is going to be an automatic consequence. He's hot. He takes off his jacket. He sets it down. This is an example of an automatic consequence. We're looking for something that is not automatic. So let's read, let's read B. Brenda eats all her son's candy from trick-or-treating after he goes to bed. Brenda eating the candy after the son goes to bed. Is anybody else providing the candy to Brenda? No, she her son's in bed, so Brenda just starts eating candy. That is also an automatic consequence. It is not socially mediated. There is not another person involved. Lucas falls off his scooter and chips a tooth, so he looks up the number to a dentist office. Lucas falling off the scooter, chipping a tooth, looking up the number to a dentist office. There is not another person involved, making this automatic as well. Lucy is too short to grab a jar off the top shelf, so the manager reaches up and grabs it for her. All right, this is socially mediated. We have Lucy who wants to grab the jar. She can't, so another person administers the consequence for her. Automatic or socially mediated. Those are our two types of consequences. Automatic is alone or the single person or learner. Socially mediated is when another person is involved with giving or providing the consequence. A behavior technician is under the supervision of a behavior analyst at the company they work for currently. The behavior technician's certification expires without the technician renewing, so the supervisor removes the technician from their cases. Is this allowed? Every year, you've got to renew your RBT certification. In this case, we have a technician who is under the supervision of an analyst, as you will be as well, at the company they work for. The technician's certification expired, and the technician did not renew. So therefore, the technician is no longer in good standing. You cannot practice and deliver services if you are not in good standing or if you're not currently licensed and certified. So the supervisor had to remove the technician. Is that allowed? Is the supervisor able to remove the technician? Or should the, the supervisor, one, have told the technician, and two, kept him on the case? Is it allowed? No, the supervisor must remind the technician that their renewal is due. Should the, should the supervisor? Maybe. But it is not the supervisor's responsibility. It is the responsibility of the RBT to renew their certification. It's going to be your responsibility to renew that certification. 
B, no, you cannot prevent someone from working on a case, even if they don't have an up-to-date certification. It's also not true. In order to practice, you've got to have the certification. That's, that's all there is to it. You have to be in good standing. You have to be certified. C, yes, the technician is fully responsible for the renewal. This is the only right answer. You're not certified. You have to come off the case. Second, the technician is responsible for the renewal. Nobody else. Should the supervisor say something? Maybe. But at the end of the day, it is the RBT's full responsibility to renew. If not, you can't practice without certification. Antoine just arrived at his dorm room on the first day of freshman year in college. College and ambassador shows Antoine how to order food from the campus delivery app. Antoine starts ordering food from that app, as well as DoorDash and Uber Eats. What is demonstrated by Antoine's behavior? So we're looking at Antoine's behavior. We know he just arrived in his dorm room, first day of freshman year. The ambassador shows Antoine how to order food from the campus app. Antoine starts ordering food, so engaging in that same response, but with DoorDash and Uber Eats. So we've got a single response here, ordering food, occurring in the presence of multiple stimuli. What do we call that? Well, obviously, some sort of generalization. Is it overgeneralization? Let's just start there. No. Overgeneralization is when a response occurs too much. It occurs at the wrong time. It occurs too often. It occurs when it should. It's not the case here. Antoine's behavior is fine. Ordering food is, is fine from all these different apps. Is he response generalizing or is he stimulus generalizing? Well, with response generalizi gener generalizing, how many responses are we looking at? Response generalization involves two or more responses because we're generalizing responses. Here we have a single response, ordering food. So what he's doing is he's generalizing responses across stimuli. He's engaging in stimulus generalization. Stimulus generalization, you have a single response that's occurring in the presence of multiple stimuli. So when trying to decide between response generalization and stimulus generalization, you want to ask yourself, how many responses am I looking at? If it's two or more, it's likely response generalization. If it's just one in the presence of many stimuli, it's probably stimulus generalization. When a scale acquisition plan is put together, what should come first in the plan? All right, finishing off with a relatively easy question. We're putting together a skill acquisition plan, sometimes called a treatment plan. We're teaching a skill. What should come first in that skill acquisition plan? What is the first thing we do? A, choosing a measurement system. Well, before we have a measurement system, we need something to measure. So we can't start there. What about B, choosing a mastery criterion? Before we can choose mastery, what are we mastering? What skill are we teaching? So we've got to start with C. You have to start by choosing a skill. You, you can't measure anything or baseline data or set a mastery criterion without a skill. So collecting baseline data on what? The skill guides everything else. It guides the measurement system. It guides mastery. It guides baseline. It guides data collection. You have to first choose a target skill. So what comes first in a skill acquisition plan? Choosing a target skill. Thank you for watching. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. As always, when you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Work hard, study hard. We'll see you soon.